NerdStalker on Twitter, and you are? Greg Gloria, aka Social Greg on Twitter for the NerdStalker Media Network. Hey, man. How's it going? Hey. Good, good. You know, I was thinking today, <clears throat> excuse me, that we were thinking, uh, actually, before this, me and Greg were having a lot of discussion, but one of the things I was thinking about today was how grateful I am to be doing this podcast with you, Greg, you know, during this time. It's really been therapeutic in a way, if you will. I don't know. Mm. We've done this before and I've never really felt about it, but like the consistency of having to do this and, and you know, reaching into like deep, deeper things and topics and stuff like that, it, it seems like it's been a pretty cool thing, right? Yeah, no, I, 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 I in gratitude too. I mean, um, I think when it first, this thing first went down and they closed down Japantown, I was kind of in a funk in a way. And then I saw that like, there was a couple of people that posted like not today, COVID-19. And I said, yeah, why not? And so then I think I, I forget how we restarted this, but we just did. And then, I, like you said, I, I, I agree. It's been very therapeutic for me. And I noticed that the stories we've been getting from week to week has become deeper too. So it's really, really neat to see the metamorphosis of this. So it's cool. good stuff. Thank you. So, yeah. so yeah, everyone, um, well, let's just get into it, right? Let's get into we it. Can do the, we can do the Patreon stuff <laughs> yes. later. They know where it is. That by, hey, give me money. Uh, okay. So <laughs> I got a, you know, I got one of those emails from a company called IDO. Uh, they are sort of like a user experience, product design, design type of company, industrial design, if you will, type of company. Very well known and amazing. They, they produce amazing work. And uh, it... it the email I got was one of those emails regarding the whole Black Lives Matter topic, right? And the current mm. sort of state of affairs and, and one of those things. And it felt like a, I, I've been getting, I'm sure you all have been getting a lot of these in terms of companies just saying they're, or stating a commitment to Black Lives Matter in some capacity or other, right? And I've been overwhelmed by these sort of things and to the point where it's almost, I was getting kind of numb to it, right? And I'm like, oh, here we go, on another company, another company. Um, so I've never really broached the topic in terms of com uh, communicating with the company in replying to one of their emails before uh, regarding this type of topic. Oh, um, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, I always thought it was for, for me, I, you know, quite frankly, I thought I was a bit risk averse. I was afraid that it may, you know, potentially, you know, put me on some sort of list and and they would be aware of somehow, and I perhaps couldn't work at their companies in the future. But now, given that I'm sort of this middle-aged, out-of-work guy, you know, I kind of have nothing to lose, and it's sort of in the air, if you will, now. And I feel more emboldened, as cowardly as that says, yeah, sounds, uh, during this time to, to speak up, right? And I just feel like now is the time for myself. You know, I can't speak for anyone else. So I wrote back when I got this sort of, this email they were sending out to, to their particular list and it was a pretty brief email and I'll read it to you guys now sort of what I wrote them it was very very brief I said um, the UX and design space has long since kept it's the UX and design space has long since kept out people of color when I would when I would look at the teams at let's say adaptive path Cooper these are all well-known former design companies which have since been uh, acquired by other companies Etc. All I would see are, you know, uh, people that don't look like me, right? Uh, and I happen to be Latino, right? And uh, darker of darker skin and stuff like that. And and as me and Greg has said before, you know, when you just look at a board of directors <laughs> for any particular design site, and oftentimes just their team pictures, and you'll you'll get what I'm sort of the getting at. And I, in fact, I even linked to one of their Instagram photos of their, you know, their team celebrating a particular event. And it sort of reflected that. And then I told them, you know, it's heartbreaking. And then I said, no more excuses. Right. So, you know, I was a bit emotional at the time. And I, I sort of uh, wrote that sort of straight from the heart and straight, you know, straight shot from the hip. Um, just uh, I gave you the context of why I sent it. Right. And they, they sent me a, a really interesting reply. Uh, I, I, frankly, I didn't even think I'd get a reply, to be honest. And someone named Alana Medaniello actually wrote back saying, Hi, Adolfo. Thank you for taking the time to share your experiences and your perspective. We know we, had a we have a lot of work to do, starting internally with the way we hire. We recognize the dearth of black, indigenous, and Latinx designers, both inside and outside of IDEO, 
and we are committed to continuously diversifying our community by hiring, promoting, and cultivating more people of color, in particular black, indigenous, and Latinx designers. We invite you to read about our talent commitments here, it's a, it's a link, and to revisit this site in the future where we will be sharing our progress. We recognize that change will not happen overnight and it's a long-term journey and we hope to show you that we mean it through our actions. Thank you for taking the time to share your thoughts with us. Warmly, Elena, and her title is Learner Support Specialist at IDEO. Um, so I found that kind of interesting. And then I, I actually clicked to the link on the IDEO's page with the, the commitment that she's referring to. It's uh, IDEO.com forward slash commitments is the URL. And uh, part of it, I'll just read part of it. It says, at IDEO, we haven't listened well enough, not inside our company, nor in a wider world. We're grateful for the comments we, re we received from our colleagues and broader community over the last two weeks. When we shared anti-racism resources last week on Instagram, it was centered on white guilt and it was wrong. We should have said clearly, Black Lives Matter. We should have called out that white dominance of the design industry and recognized the harsh truths of our industry's role in perpetuating inequality. And we should have acknowledged directly that IDO as a leader has been part of the problem. So I just wanted to call that out. Uh, I find that a sort of a, a, a brave statement by a company to point out a long-standing uh, issue in within the design and services, creative services community, uh, which I've been myself guilty of being silent about for quite some time for fear of, again, retribution, my own fear. I should have uh, come forward and I had a reluctancy to do so. Um, and I, you know, I think right now being an out of work, middle-aged male, dark-skinned Latino is um, a trifecta of difficulty for me in terms mm -hmm. of challenges right now and in terms of uh, biases within company hiring and things like that. Um, I recognize that sounds like me feeling sorry for myself, but I, but I actually do kind of see that as a particular challenge right now. Um, and uh, one thing to be aware of too, this isn't just a sort of a white on dark skinned people thing. There's also uh, intercultural racism within ethnic communities with each other, right? Um, so the black community may feel a certain way about other type of, you know, color communities, the Hispanic community, even within themselves have various types of, you know, uh, cultural differences and stereotypes that they hold against each other and, and, we can go on and on with that type of thing. So it's just sort of this mindset. And uh, one thing that I was real hopeful about was I heard a, um, and I hate this term young people, I hate it because it sort of <laughs> reinforces that sort of ageism type of thing. But I did hear someone of the generation Z at a uh, Starbucks as I was picking something up, who was a Caucasian young lady who was actually talking about the topic and, and empathizing uh, before I was even there, you know, uh, about this type of thing and how people of color have been excluded, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it made me hopeful, you know, that this this particular generation will be um, perhaps uh, more active than, you know, the the older generations have been. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of where, where that's that wonderful. Going. Good for you. I'll, I'll, I'll put the uh, clap meter on, and, uh, <laughs> the applause <laughs> meter on uh, when, the, uh, when we edit this. But I think that, uh, you know, I... You know, you got me thinking about culture um, when you started talking about even within um, yeah. certain races, uh, there's 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 prejudice and, and yeah. thoughts about each other. But, uh, you know, it's interesting when you go back to, um, you know, I was talking to some, my, one of my friends and we were talking about, you know, you know, when you talk about white race, it's really a conglomeration of different Mm -hmm. white skin cultures right mm -hmm. so, but they're also been part of these cultures that have been here so long that they've lost their culturization mm -hmm. exactly, exactly. I, it's really fascinating when you think about it because i mean because i think when i have a lot of my friends um you know that that are white you know they mm -hmm. don't really mention culture in a lot of the things they talk about that just mm -hmm. you know there's not there's none of that 
you know, there's none of that type of stuff. So it's mm. interesting, really interesting. Um, even, um, you know, and not to step on your toes, but even within the Asian community, um, oftentimes Indians aren't even lumped into that type of conversations. Oh. And within the Asian community itself, there's a hierarchy of, you know, Japanese versus Chinese versus Korean versus Cambodian. Oh, I mean, I can go on and on. Absolutely. Uh, and, and those longstanding sort of, you know, historical tensions, if you will. Um, yeah. 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 So it's just a, it's yeah. an interesting thing to broach and we should all be aware of and try to rectify. Yeah. Well, good on you, man. I'm glad that uh, you had the guts and the determination to write back. And then I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by IDO as well, having someone actually respond to your email. I mean, like you yeah, said, I, cool. wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. have expected yeah. one. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I encourage all of you, you know, in your particular field of interest, go look at their board of director sites, go look at their team photos and their social media photos and, and track it, you know, and to see if they are making any progress visually, if you will, right, as much as you can. Um, and then just go from there. I, I, I'm hopeful. Yeah. Hire this guy, right. IDO. Hire this guy. <laughs> all right, Greg. <laughs> Uh, eBay. Oh my God, uh, this is this goes into the muck and ruck section of, 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 of this. So this is a uh, this is thanks to Tech Dirt, and we got um, Carl Bode or Bode uh, on this from the utterly batshit department uh, column. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, the title of this one is eBay execs thought sending dead pigs, live spiders, to small news website was a good idea. Um, so let's just kind of go give you guys a little bit of background for this. Um, apparently, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they, they did have this pop quiz on there. So well, a couple of posters, a, real, a relatively small news website, kind of like us, uh, critical of your massive and hugely profitable corporation. Do you, A, simply ignore the criticism, B, consider whether the grievances are legitimate and take steps to improve your company, or C, Unleash a brutal summer-long campaign of terror and surveillance that includes sending the website publishers, threatening DMs, live spiders, pornography, and dead pigs. <laughs> Apparently, if you're employed at eBay, the answer is an enthusiastic C. <laughs> oh. Six executives and employees of eBay are now facing federal charges as they participate in a massive, grotesque harassment campaign targeting the publishers of a small news outlet, ecommercebytes.com, by the way. Uh, wow. published by David and Ina Steiner, critical of eBay, said harassment campaign included sending porn to Steiner's neighbor under their name and also sending them live spiders, bloody pig masks, cockroaches, and even dead pig fetus. Why? They were upset by both the newsletter and anonymous commenters. Quote, members of the executive leadership team at eBay followed the newsletter's post often taking issue with its content and uh, anonymous comments underneath the editor's stories. It is alleged that in August 2019, after the newsletter published an article about litigation involving eBay, two members of eBay's executive leadership team sent or forwarded text messages suggesting it was time to take down the newsletter's editor. In response, Ball, Harville, Pop, Gilbert, Z, Stockwell and other allegedly executed a three-part harassment campaign. Among things, several of the defendants ordered anonymous and disturbing deliveries to the victor's home, including a preserved fetal pig, a bloody pig Halloween mask, a funeral <laughs> leaf, a, a book on surviving the loss of a spouse, and pornography. Oh the last of these addressed to the newsletter's publisher, but sent to his neighbor's homes. It sounds um, like you're making this up. This is how crazy I know, this is. I know, this I know. Is like, this is, this is totally this crazy. crazier and crazier. I don't make this up. I mean, I, wow. I, I read some of Tech Dirt stuff and not all of it, but this one just caught my eye. I just like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm such an eBay. Oh I'm such an eBay person, right? So I just wow. wanted to you know, check this out. Can you imagine? It sounds <laughs> like this Tiger true. King or something, an episode yeah. of Tiger King or, you know, <laughs> something. It's an absolute madness. All right, you guys. All right. Enough of that madness. Let's move it. So, Let's uh, move it in. Yeah. So thanks to Business Insider's uh, Marguerite Ward for this story. Tech company Buffer is adopting a four day work week through the end of the year to help employees deal with with stress caused by coronavirus. Mm. Uh, Buffer, a social media 
management software company announced Tuesday that it's adopting a four-day work week through the end of 2020. This comes after the company experimented with a four-day work week in May to help workers deal with the stress caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Employees will get their full salary despite the time reduction. Using a company-wide survey, Buffer measured employee happiness, autonomy, and stress levels. Company leaders saw a positive increase in worker happiness and autonomy and a significant decrease in stress levels. But the four days employees worked during the experiment were not the same across the board, which caused some planning difficulties. But for plans to keep running the four day work week experiment through the end of 2020, it may adjust the policy to address challenges per a company blog post. Buffer already has some progressive company policies, including a fully remote workforce and a transparent salary formula. The tech company isn't the first to experiment with the schedule. Microsoft previously tried a four day work week in Japan and saw a 40% jump in productivity. Former presidential candidate Andrew Yang recently called on more business leaders to adopt the setup to improve Americans' mental health. So more info on, on a lot of that stuff for a deeper dive, go to uh, Business Insider, we'll include the link. Uh, I love the idea and I've been uh, calling on this for quite some time. So it's good to see some data backing it up in terms of um, productivity gains and potentially what's looking like an employee happiness and stress yeah, level reduction. Uh, Buffer's an interesting company. I think we inter we interviewed them in 2014 when they were really, really small, actually. Wow. Uh, yeah. Joel Gascon uh, mm -hmm. is, is the CEO. And I think yeah. um, what was impressive as I've been following them on and off over the last few years is that, you know, they even went through kind of a layoff period that were they were very transparent about. You know, he, he wrote openly about his feelings about some of this stuff. Sure. And, um I can see where that company is very um, compassionate. And and we do see other companies, like I mentioned here was Microsoft, right? Which is yeah. a gigantic company who's following some of those, some of those sort of traits. So it's uh, encouraging and hopefully, you know, a lot of these small companies grow to become rather large companies yeah. with this type of mindset and uh, culture. And yeah. boy, that would be uh, great for the future. All right. All right. Let's, well, let's go to a contrarian, another contrarian article. I don't know why I'm in the mood for contrarian articles this week, but I, I am, <laughs> obviously. Uh, so this is, comes from Bloomberg Opinion. It's an op-ed um, from Tyler Cohen. And the, after the crisis, uh, it's big tech won't be the same if everyone works from home. Virtual tools can't replicate the intellectual frizzing. Uh, I have to look that up. I don't know what that means. Uh, of, <laughs> yeah, I don't know, yeah, <laughs> of gathering smart people together. As a result, innovation and productivity may suffer. So um, he goes on to write here. Um, as the coronavirus pandemic continues, um, you know, Bloomberg is going to be writing, writing a several of these series about uh, long-term consequences of this crisis. And this is a, a, a writer's opinion about you know, should you work from home or work in an office? So there's no question that we are being saved by technology during this pandemic as we use Zoom for our educational entertainment and rely on Amazon for just about everything else. <laughs> Still, we may need to worry about uh, whether big tech itself will retain its strength and in innovation after this crisis, given that employees won't have as many employees working side by side in the office anymore. About 60% of Americans have been working from home say they like to continue to do so once the pandemic is over many employers are happy to permit it. From the obviously conveniences, distance work has its drawbacks. Elite tech companies in particular run the risk of losing the highly effective corporate cultures they've built. And tech labor could end up being increasingly commoditized and underpaid. If the remote working trend can, becomes the norm for tech, Silicon Valley might end up losing what it has made it special. This guy There's is saying, so many facets to this, and, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, it's not an all or nothing thing for sure. You know, I think, uh, as, as is sort of the general theme with Nerdstalker, uh, the truth always is somewhere in the shade of gray. Right. But, um, like my, my significant other is she, she prefers in office work, you know, in that face to face type of thing. Me, I, I prefer remote work, uh, as little as I've done of it, but I, you know, to be quite frank, I haven't done it full time, so I can't speak as an expert on, on the matter. Uh, but I do like it when I've been the, ha, uh, given the opportunity to do so. Um, your thoughts on this, Greg? You know, I, and I'm in between both of you, right? I, mm -hmm. I, I have the ability to go down to Japantown, see people, um, have meetings. In fact, I think I went out of the city for the first time 
yesterday drove my car outside the borders of the city. <laughs> it was kind of amazing, but that's another story. I, 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 I see where I'm working at home. I have my roommate. She has kind of like another office area. That I, I just let her be and she does all her stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then at lunchtime, we come together. So we kind of have this kind of quasi office environment you know, yeah. where, where, you know, I used to work in my cubicle, you know, and then maybe get up and maybe meet some of my coworkers uh, at break mm -hmm. time when I want a coffee or uh, at lunch when we want to just go out and get lunch. But, you know, pretty much we had our own individual lives in the office and, and come together. Maybe once we have like a common customer together, we go out and see the customer. You know, I, I, you know, the Silicon Valley culture, you know, I grew up with it. Um, you know, as, after college, I went to work for advanced micro devices and, you know, mm -hmm. you know, enamored by their big cafeterias, the, mm -hmm. you know, seeing the CEO there who was really kind of flamboyant, you know, driving his convertible to the office every day, you know, kind of like into that culture, right? And then the, the got into the culture of the big Silicon Valley parties, right? They provide all mm -hmm. that, you know, really large, you know, enormous things with heavy buffets, right? And it was just mm -hmm. like, wow, man, this is really cool, right? As a young person, right? Impressed mm -hmm. by that, right? Mm -hmm. And then as I got older, you know, some of that stuff just didn't matter to me anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. Uh, the one issue that I do take with this, um, with the writer of this this article is that um, I think uh, Silicon Valley has been on this trajectory for a long time of it becoming not as relevant or you know as as it once was and and you know the, this notion of remote work is a it's been a train that's been heading in a general direction for quite some time and and the cats left the bag and sorry for all these funny analogies but it's it's just sort of a it's kind of a done deal and now even even the notion of tech hubs more and more increasingly are becoming less important now especially now this only highlights that we can do things anywhere there's been obviously overseas labor for quite some time and what does that do that brings down the the cost of everything and the wages of everything too and i've been arguing this for some time that everyone was going to computer science everyone was going to computer science and i've heard gary v talk about this too what mm -hmm. do you think what happens to salaries when everyone's going in one particular direction right they they go down because the cost of those people versus the supply of of talent you know if you will or skills if you will um goes down right that, that particular scale and um so I mean that that's been happening for some time. Um, it, as far as choosing to be socially interactive or not, you know, at work, it's I separate work and personal quite some bit as much as much as I can, right? So, I, of course, I want to be with my friends face to face and my family face to face and my extended family face to face. Um, my coworkers, it depends, right? <laughs> sometimes yes, sometimes no. It depends, you know. Well, but tying I back to like a, the buffer story, I think. Uh, the one thing positive takeaway of of uh, Silicon Valley's influence is this sort of um, uh, ability for companies to experiment with our culture and things like how often you go in or you don't and and all kinds of things, transparent pay and, and all these very non-traditional sort of business type of functions uh, that are now occurring throughout the world, really. Right. Um, but what I will say is since that's so expected and prevalent in Silicon Valley, I think that will be the the maybe the initial sort of generator of that type of thought um although mm -hmm. the you know the startup business is is global now right absolutely and a lot of that type of thing and and the as you were pointing to the things that aren't, weren't important like the buffets and the ping pong tables and all those things now that we're realizing especially with shelter in place and, and remote work anyway thank speed you round. speed round speed round speed round Philly from the philadelphia inquirer I'd like to thank Jeremy Roebuck of the Philadelphia Inquirer. The FBI used a Philly protester's Etsy profile, LinkedIn, and other internet history to charge her with setting police cars ablaze. So as demonstrators shouted fires, uh, burned outside City Hall, and Philadelphia convulsed with outrage over Mr. Floyd, television news helicopters footage, a masked woman with a peace sign tattoo and wearing a light blue t-shirt setting a police SUV ablaze. More than two weeks after that climactic May 30 moment, federal authorities say they've identified the arsonist as 33-year-old Philadelphia massage therapist, Laura Elizabeth Blumenthal, by following the intricate trail of breadcrumbs she left through her social media history and online shopping patterns over the years. 
The path took agents from Instagram, where amateur photographers also captured shots of the masked arsonist, to an Etsy shop that sold the distinctive t-shirt the woman was wearing in the video. It led investigators to her LinkedIn page, to her profile on her fashion website, Poshmark, and eventually to her doorstep in Germantown. Their pursuit... Germantown's a link to some particular right. thing. Right, <laughs> Their right, pursuit right. described in court filings this week sheds light on the extent to which the FBI and Justice Department have used news footage, online histories, and social media footprints to track down and identify demonstrators believed to be responsible for acts of violence and property destruction. But civil rights advocates say it also raises questions about the scope of law enforcement surveillance and protest of protest movements and the use of the very social media networks that protesters have relied upon to spread their message. Social media has fueled much of the protests and has also become a fertile ground for government surveillance, said Paul Hesnicker, an attorney who has organized a group of lawyers to represent demonstrators, including Blumenthal. Quote, I think people have lost awareness of that, unquote. Absolutely. I mean, you're out, if you're out there, um, you know, unless you go back to your flip phone, um, they'll be tracking you. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Greg and his weekly flip phone. I know. I just speed 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 round. All right. <laughs> Let's, well, you know, you love Boston Dynamics spot. Well, you could have them for $74,500. So, so now any, any person could buy this. So it took uh, Boston Dynamics a quarter of a century to release its first commercial product. But, um, but you know, you could understand it was pretty complicated, right? So uh, according to the company, some 150 spot robots were made available to businesses and research facilities in, in an earlier program. And certainly uh, you got to use uh, uh, globally from construction sites to social distancing in Singapore to see a lot of these, these people, right? Um, so some of the earlier adopters, you know, uh, the, you know got, got a hold of these robots, but now, um, you know, you could actually purchase one of these babies. So starting to, uh, well, the other day, um, businesses in the United States can purchase Spot Explorer Dev Kit for a cool 70, four thousand five hundred dollars limited to per customer by the way um and that'll get you spot the robot two spot batteries spot charger uh tablet controller and charger robot case for storage and transportation uh, you need that probably for spot uh power case for battery charger and storage python client packages for spots apis <laughs> uh, software updates when available and the standard warranty um so jump on board get spot the robot if you want to start developing with them and make them do some cool things but by the way uh, you know you're not going to be using it for evil or anything like that speed round speed round all right so thanks to jabari young of cnbc for this particular story uh, medium ceo ev williams announced thursday that colin kaepernick is joining the company as a board member and will publish his own blog on the site of on anti-black racism and civil rights Kaepernick, the free agent NFL quarterback, will publish content focused on race and civil rights in America, the company said in a statement announcing the collaboration. He says, I am excited for Kaepernick publishing to partner with Medium to continue to elevate black voices in the news and publishing industry, Kaepernick said in a statement. I also look forward to creating new opportunities and avenues for black writers and creators with my role, my new role as a board member. Williams, a Twitter co-founder, said the two sides have been in discussions for some time, adding Medium will tap into Kaepernick's perspective as a partner and leader. In his new role, Kaepernick will write and contribute to editorial features for Medium's new blog, Momentum, which will discuss anti-Black racism and civil rights in our society. He will also interview high-profile leaders, activists, and athletes, and create content from these interviews that will live on Medium, the release said. Wow. That's cool. Good luck. That's it. That's yeah. good move good on luck, the Medium's part. Speed round. <laughs> okay, here's here's something revisiting us from the past. Uh, thank you, Business Insider Katie Canales, for this. Uh, Silicon Valley's elite wants yet again to abandon land and live on floating cities in the middle of the ocean that wow, operate again. outside. Yeah, dude, this comes back like a boomerang to us every time. But I of just, course, yeah, I was waiting so, for this. Yeah, you like that? So over a decade ago, you know, Silicon Valley billionaire investor and Trump advisor Peter Thiel poured 1.7 million into uh, 
a mission to erect floating politically autonomous cities in the middle of the ocean, right? Because they're outside of the borders of, 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 of any country at that point, right? We're talking about open water, right? And uh, so back then he, uh, you know, backtracked on his dream <laughs> of the libertarian utopia that the article says. Um, and uh, the concept of building permanent settlements at sea that would operate independently from existing nations and remind an interesting uh, uh, interest among valley inner circles. So, so anyway, a new report from the Telegraph's Margie Murphy uh, details how some are once again turning to seastead communities as COVID-19 pandemic has freed many non-workers from being physically located near their offices, going back to that whole work from home thing now. There you go, Nerd Soccer City, man. Let's do it. Tip time. Oh, yeah. Tip time, tip time. I love tip time. Tip time. All right, tip time. So this one is uh, a little Amazon product, if you will. Uh, and you might have seen these things as sort of joke glasses in the past, but now they're actually selling quite a bit on Amazon. All right. So this is the Utrex Prism Bed Specs. It's, it's just they threw in every word as like uh, keywords here, right? So basically Ooh. they're glasses that you can sort of look, you can be laying down and read your book, right? Or, or you know, <laughs> your, while you're laying down, right? So you don't have to crank your neck. But what people are using these for increasingly is just sitting up and looking at your phone. So you don't have to do the whole neck hunch thing, your neck down, you know? Oh, interesting. So your posture isn't screwed up. Now, th this is uh, particular of interest to me this morning because I woke up with a really bad back and neck this morning. So I'm like trying oh, to massage this oh, stuff out, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, being yeah. the old man with the, you know, that I am now. And, and so, <laughs> I mean, these are like $12.55. Um, and there's a, this is by a company called Utrax. We'll, we'll include the link. Um, you can find a slew of these on Amazon. They, they range in the $12 to $20 range. But effectively, it's like a periscope, right? Or two mirrors pointing down. So if you look at the glasses, you could be looking straight and sitting up, and then you just hold a book or your device uh, below you like you normally would. You just look straight ahead, and you can read the thing perfectly. But what I like about these ones in particular is you still have peripheral vision. And some of the other ones, they block your peripheral vision. They're more kind of like goggle-like or more wraparound-like. Mm, yeah, 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 which is yeah. Which kind of weird. So, I mean, these are cool for home. Uh, they might be kind of creepy if you're on a commuter or something like that, and you're looking directly into someone right across from you, but you're looking down at your device. This person will be saying, why is this person staring right at me with their weird <laughs> glasses, but they're actually got an open book below them or their device, right? Psycho, psycho Greg, stop staring at me. So uh, check it out, you guys. Uh, yeah, these are the Periscope eyeglasses. <laughs> wow, what a tip. That's the best tip since we've been doing this, man. <laughs> tip time, tip time. Tip time, all right. Well, ah, uh, Google. Not of the Google one. <laughs> How to always show few full URLs in Google Chrome. So uh, thanks to um, How To Geek, uh, Chris Hoffman, for this. Uh, uh, Google Chrome typically hides the HTTPS and the WW, right, just to just to make sure that you know they get short and everything uh but if you want to see the whole url which i think sometimes i i i have have the desire to see it sometimes um this option uh, requires enabling a hidden flag in google chrome to find it copy paste the following uh text in the chrome's address bar and you'll see you know if you're on the full url or not and then uh click the box and select enabled and uh relaunch chrome and you're good to go and you could always reset that back again uh, <laughs> and then and, and so if you want to see full urls um you could do this so i'm done nice. I'm, I'm out of here <laughs> very yeah. nice Tim. all right <laughs> thanks greg and thank you all again for uh watching and listening to nerd stalker uh please check us out patreon.com forward slash nerd stalker to support us uh, we really would appreciate that and also give us a thumbs up hit the like subscribe hit the bell wherever you're at um any nice feedback we'd appreciate it i am adolfo fronda at nerd stalker on twitter and Greg, where can we get more information about you? Hey, I'm Greg Gloria, aka Social Greg on Twitter. You can reach me at socialgreg at nerdsoccer.com if you have any stories, articles, or comments on this podcast. So uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, go to our Patreon page, and uh, we have also a link uh, to help Adolfo our Patreon out. Patreon cage. Yeah. Cage. Cage. It's a cage that you walk I'm into. Sorry. And yeah, we trap I screwed you. that one up. And, we, and you throw your money. <laughs> siphon the money from your cage. Patreon.com 
Flash <laughs> nerd stalker. Thank you. And then uh, PayPal, uh, PayPal me uh, to Adolfo Ferrando. Please help him out. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching again. We appreciate it. All right. Be careful out there. I have no feeling.